everybody. Welcome to Holy Foley. I'm your host, Dr. Vanessa Thimo Mint. And today's guest is Miguel Barbosa, who is a Foley artist and sound designer in Spain. And he works at um, an organization called Sound Troop. Welcome, Miguel. It is so great to see you again. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a while. I um, interviewed you for um, a second edition of uh, the Foley Grail. And we talked at great length about your work then. And that was a while ago because I was living in Atlanta and working mm -hmm. on my um, dissertation before I got my PhD. And since then, I worked as an endowed chair in Indiana at Ball State. And now I've finished that. And I'm back in California. So um, it's great to talk to you. I'm really fascinated to hear all about your work at Sound Troop, which I understand you are a partner in this facility with your Foley mixer. I wanna hear about that. I wanna hear about your um, methods of doing what you like to call Foley on location. And at some point you were teaching Foley. So first off, let's start out with the kinds of projects you're working on right now. And you you live and work in the province of Galicia, Galicia in Spain. I've been to Spain and um, part of my family um, is originally from Spain, the Canary Islands, the De La Rocha part of my family. They did a land swap back during the Maximilian regime and ended up in Durango, Mexico, um, the De La Rochas, and they had gold and silver mines and then had to leave before the revolution, which is how that part of my family ended up in yeah, California. Sorry. Yeah, they married into the Aments. And um, that's so the Aments strain of my family has relatives in Mexico. And uh, my grandfather was born in Mexico, and um, and we are Castilian Spanish. Um, so we are from the De La Rochas are from you know of the Rock, from the Rock being mm. Canary Islands. So, but we had this discussion. Oh. Talk to you back in the day, but anyway, so it's a pleasure to see you. And how are you doing? And tell me what you've been working on recently. Well. Uh... Uh, I'm fine. I'm very busy normally. Uh, uh, like you said, we we last talked. I think it was in 2013 or 14. Yeah. I don't know, probably around that. Uh, I used to work in another place um, with my Foley partner Diego. Uh, I mean, my Foley partner. He's uh, the uh, the mixer. Not uh, not another artist, and uh, we used to work there, but uh, there were some there were some problems with the with the company. Basically, not not getting paid sometimes. So that that, that can uh, that's a little bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something, and uh, we ended up uh, uh, building our our own thing. We started uh, in that transition. We started the work at, uh, at at Diego's house. Uh, we had like a complete uh, floor for us, and uh, a plant or floor. Well, I don't know how to say. It. Well, we have a we had a we, we had to to work there uh, on some projects until we built uh, this new facility, which is where we work. Uh, ninety percent of the time. Uh, we're now more. We it's me. It's uh Diego. It's Kevin. It's Kevin. It's uh Chess. And I think that's it. We're five uh people now, uh, working and doing foley most of the, most of the time. But uh, this is a. Not not only a foley facilities we all we also do sound post production and but uh, the sound post production we do uh, the whole process is basically for projects uh, from from within here. So uh, uh, let me just close one thing and uh, and yes yes uh, life has been very good so far well that's great and do you work um mm -hmm. primarily on small like independent projects or do you work on some bigger films do you work on long form for streaming television shows or do you mix it up uh, we kind of work on many 
different projects. We can work for very big projects uh, for the Spanish film industry and also very big projects for the European film industry. But also sometimes in small projects, uh, more low, more low budget. Uh, it depends on the time. But uh, there was a moment where uh, this kind of plat uh, streaming platforms started uh, their business here in Spain too, which I think it was in maybe two thousand and fifteen, sixteen, and the the production for TV shows more uh, elaborated started to to happen here, and uh, for Netflix, uh, HBO, the, uh, now Disney Plus, yes. and this uh, and but and yes, we we used to do a lot of films, but uh, we do now sometimes the same kind of uh, amount of price for TV shows. And, but, uh, you know, these TV shows that uh, have uh, a lot of uh, character and professionalism, I think. Now that you have your own, your own place, has your mm -hmm. approach to how you work now that you have more control, has it changed mm -hmm. from when you were working for someone else? Has it changed the way you approach your work and your workflow and how you manage your time has that changed it changed uh, the the style because uh, uh um we always loved uh, the way the the french guys do you know with uh, uh, interior spaces sounding very interior and exterior sounding very exterior so uh we uh, at the studio we have um, different microphones uh, everywhere, mm -hmm. so we can have that feeling of uh, that feeling of uh, perspective, and that's done with the um, uh, the the mixer does that basically, and uh, I think that's something I always loved, and we always uh, we have always loved and. Uh, or something we wanted to do and uh, i think for us in spain there's only one or two studios that uh, do it that way because uh, i mean you've heard the uh, european cinema and and i re i really i really like it that way what got you interested in the french sound aesthetic and, and the reason I ask about this is because I would have to say as an American from Hollywood sound training mm. um, and I say this with all respect to all of my um, Hollywood sound professional friends there is a, a sense in Hollywood of just sticking to the way we do things in Hollywood we have some people in Los Angeles who try different ways but in general there is this sense of there's the american sound way of doing sound and that's the way we do it it's this hyper real within the studio mm. um way of doing things and there is this um hollywood centric perspective and i think it's because we're the the big the big dog and I understand it, and it's there's a lot of money there, and there's and it's very good training, and we have a really good system. However, when I started really studying this from a film studies perspective and doing my research and interviewing people from all over the world, and and I was the first Foley artist to interview people from all over the world that in the Foley Grail, you know, interviewing people and learning so much about the different ways people all over the world approach doing Foley. And I listened to film and noticed that the sound aesthetics in foreign films would be so different. I was fascinated at the different ways people approached doing sound in different countries. And the French were very different, which is not surprising because the French is a very independent minded culture. Its whole history mm. is that way. And they get teased about it, but I really admire it. And having talked to 
only one French Foley artist, but talked to a lot of people who learned from the French. Um, the um, Turkish Foley artists that are now coming up talked to the French. The Canadians talked to the French. Um, a lot of people have talked to the French. A lot of people are talking to people from other countries about how to learn Foley. What was it about the French methodology and the French sound that fascinated you that made you want to adopt some of their ways of doing things? I mean, if you if, if you hear a session from them, well, the sessions I had uh, uh, the chance to to give the listen, I mean, you could you could just hear the reality of of it. So for me, that was amazing and. It was not something that only was done by the artist because uh, the approach there are, there are themes that I like from 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 the French, but there are other things that I don't like for but for, because for example they and in Europe uh, people used to uh, walk uh, only with one foot one feet uh, a lot of times and I, and what I really like is the combination between the the good here and the good there right and uh, and in hollywood i've seen all the artists walking with uh, with the, with, the, with the two feet and and that's for me that's a much better way to do it but if you if you get the the good things from one place and one, and the other good things uh, that maybe you like from other places I mean that uh, that uh, creates uh, a sense of criticism in in your head, and and you can combine and, and, and um, different techniques and different approaches to to what you want to be your style. Because uh, recording that way doesn't mean that you cannot do it super hyper real. It means that you have that option. Which is very good for some kind of uh, of films. A lot of times, uh, films in Europe are in lots of uh, natural uh, locations, like you know, in big uh, castles and big houses, uh, empty places. Those things uh, having the the French uh, mentality of recording it, it sounds amazing mm -hmm. I mean, to me. I've been doing the last uh, Alice's Rohrbacher uh, films, Happy as Lazzaro, and the new one, the the Chimera, the Chimera. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I think in English is like that. And uh, the filming locations are very very natural. These Italian super uh, super realistic uh, places. If you recorded the the way the the French uh, have always did, have always done it. I mean. It sounds, uh, for me, is the, the best way. Because you can, uh, of course, uh, river and processing in your, during the mix. But having that very first capture sound in that way, I think that's what make it, makes it uh, very real. And it helps the, the artist because uh, you sound much uh, authentic, I think. But in other places, in other projects, I... I I get the Hollywood uh, mentality. It it just depends on the on the project, but it's not it's it's good to to have the the different options and and being concerned that uh, what's been done what's been done all around the world. And I only basically know the the way the uh, the, the Americans do and the way the French do. I don't really know the way the Italians do. I think it's probably similar to the Americans, but I don't really know. I know that, for example, the uh, in, in Germany they used to do footsteps uh, seated. Yes. And uh, and that's something I I've, I've always tried to to give it a shot, but I don't know. Uh, for me, that's uh, super weird. It seems to be the the most uh, normal thing there, but you know you've talked to probably to Germans, 
more than me and, and they can tell you why do they like that yeah you know i have um i've spoken to a couple of german foley artists and there was there has been a tradition of sitting while doing footsteps and way back when i was not a really new foley artist but somewhere in the late 80s i worked with a Foley artist from actually Europe, and he'd worked in Germany and in France. And the film was called Jake Speed. And he was, his name was Emile, I believe. I believe he was French, but he worked in Germany. And he did, I worked with him. I was the second Foley artist working with him. And he sat down doing the footsteps he did. When I do footsteps, I don't do left, right, left, right, left, right. I'll do left, right, right, left, right, left, left, because I don't want every footstep to have a predictable sound. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, sound, because when we walk in the world, every footstep is walking a little bit differently depending because we're moving forward and the street changes or the room changes. It isn't even. And this goes back to a theory Walter Murch has, which I'll, cha I'll, say, I'll share in a minute. He was sitting down the whole time and... I was baffled, but I was not going to challenge the person who hired me to work with him. And I wasn't going to question him and I wasn't going to cause trouble because I wasn't really one to cause trouble with the people I was working with just in general. But I was humored because I didn't really know why he was doing it, but okay. Um, <clears throat> the mixer knew how to work with him, knew exactly how to handle anyone on the stage. <laughs> but you know he was European and he had his own way of doing things and I was humored what I have learned from interviewing lots of different people and it's mostly men it's a very male dominated business I look very hard mm -hmm. for women to talk to because we are dominated by men and men often think their way of doing it is the only way to do it and I've been fighting that forever I've been fighting forever, especially the men my age and older, think they know it all. I get to the younger men and they're more open-minded. But it is amazing how the men my age and older just are always right. And the younger men are more open-minded because they've grown up in a changing world. But as I've talked to people all over the world, there are many different ways of approaching our work. And um, I talked with mixers and people who knew Walter Merch very, very, very well. Cause I've talked, I worked in the Bay area for two years, both at Skywalker and at Fantasy Salzant. So I worked with everybody there. And of course, Walter Merch is the big deal there. And they all knew Walter really well. And I'd only met Walter a couple of times, but I worked with Alan Splett and I worked with all of the people in the Bay area in the um, 80s when I was doing my master's in the Bay Area and doing Foley there. And Walter Murch was one who did not like at all the idea of a sanitized Foley stage and doing Foley on it. He hates that idea. He likes getting out in the world and recording in a location. And I'm astounded that the Foley artists in Los Angeles do not even know this. <laughs> they do not even know this. Oh. Um, wow. They completely repeat this idea of Foley has to be done on a Foley stage while they extol Walter Murch. And yet Walter Murch went on the Foley stage during the English patient and was very harsh with the Foley artists not wanting them to do footstep, footstep, footstep. He wanted them to do every other footstep or every third footstep because he didn't want to hear every footstep. And it was very hard for them to try to do this because it's not natural. Wow. But he would do anything to not make it sound sanitized and recorded. He would take people out during Godfather 3 and have them walk on surfaces outside. He would go into um, old buildings and have them record footsteps in old buildings. He he was very adventurous. So mm. this notion that 
we've always recorded on a stage only comes from the idea that Jack Foley was on a sound stage beginning this process, recording in sync with this one take where all the sounds mm. got started. They were recording the voices, the music, and a few sounds that he and his guys were doing in the very early days of recording before there was editing, because editing came later, um, in the late 20s and early 30s, before there was editing, recording some sounds. And then it gets locked into everybody that it's always been done like that. Well, it only got started that way. People were always trying to find different ways of doing things. So these, these myths get started, but there's always been people trying new things. Mark Mangini on Green Mile took a portable Pro Tools and tried to get the Foley artists to walk actually at a prison, I think, because it's in my first edition. I saw, I saw that. I saw that clip. Yeah. Right. He tried to get the walking somewhere else. They're always trying new things. So um, I remember we talked about this before. I will tell you that the Italian Foley artists coming from the notion of neorealism, because after World War II, everything had been destroyed in the war. And they were recording. The reason that they recorded without sound and replaced all their sound afterwards was because um, Cinecita had been destroyed in World War II. So they have Italian neorealism with all the sound being replaced because they had no studios. So they're shooting outside and everything has to be replaced afterwards, all the sound. And in all of um, Sergio Leone's films, everything's replaced. And a lot of it's done outside. And I talked to two Italian Foley artists and they still do a lot of the recorded sound outside. It's now a tradition. They will do some inside and they will do a lot of it outside. There are Foley artists in Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, um, who do a lot of sound recorded outside. So this is becoming something that people like to try. They're always looking mm. for innovative ways to get a different way of doing things. So I'm humored that we in the United States are kind of stuck in this notion. I do understand why we're heavily unionized. We've got these beautiful stages with high tech ways of recording. And I will proudly say that I think we do it. We have the very best. We have beautifully trained Foley artists, beautifully trained mixers, beautiful technology. A lot of money goes into it and we do fantastic work. There's really no reason for us to go outside. We have amazing facilities. We can mix in ways that make everything sound fantastic. And I'll tell you a wonderful story. I mean I went so, something that, that something that you cannot deny is that uh, having it done on a stage is much faster and it's faster uh, and you can have incredible control exactly exactly incredible control of the situations yes and we have incredible because, uh, if, you, if you go outside you, you can you can you can have the whole world there you never know if it's a, if if a dog if a dog is going to bark, if uh, a car is going to pass by, uh, millions of things. But I'll, but I'll tell you a story, a story that I know this from Orson Welles. So Henry Jaglum was a director who made small films and he was friends with Orson Welles. And I am friends with someone who knew Orson Welles very well, a producer by the name of Larry Jackson. And Orson Welles, very famously, Henry Jaglum would complain, Orson, you have all this money. You can do whatever you want. I am limited with what I can do on my film. And he said, the limitations are what cause you to be innovative. Now I'm paraphrasing, but the lesson here is when you have a lot of money, sometimes you get flabby. When you don't have a lot of money, that's when you learn how to innovate. So either way can lead to a great result. 
Mm. If you don't have a lot of money and you don't have a lot of resources, you learn to innovate. But if you have a lot of money, you have the resources. So recently I went to a sound um, a dub stage at Warner Brothers and got to hear Bradley Cooper talk about using a multi-track dialogue um, recording system like Robert Altman used on his films where they recorded multi-track dialogue on the set for some of the um, party scenes from Maestro where there were um, all on the set recording all the dialogue of all of the party goers and they were mixing it on the set. This is not done very often and it's beautifully recorded and mixed on the set. And then they go to re-recording and the re-recording mixers are balancing it. But it was not done in ADR. It was not done in automated dialogue replacement. It was done on the set. He innovated. He decided to take Altman's idea and they can perfect it now because technology has advanced so much. So this is taking that old innovation and using the modern technology and making it even better. So it's the best of both worlds. So I love talking to people who are trying all these ideas because we keep learning better and better ways. So your idea of location fully, which I think we can learn, we can learn all of these different things. And Walter Murch still prefers trying new things rather than the sanitized way of always doing it on a stage. Because I think we get used to things that we're comfortable with and then we don't take risks. I think there's a danger yeah. in getting comfortable. So I would say, I, I, I talked to um, a Foley artist in, uh, in um, Norway on the last episode, who's trying all sorts of innovations he thinks outside the box all the time. Rune van Dures. And I learn a lot talking to all of you because I'm from the Hollywood system. And I want to hear what other people are doing. And the French character of being very independent, I mean, they were the resistance in World War II. They are known for their independence. And, and the Spanish have a character and the Italians have a character and the Northern Europeans have a character. We can all learn from each other. And I think that's what's fascinating. Exactly. I've started uh, uh, doing footsteps at the beginning of me, my career with only one foot, but uh, the American way too. And uh, I combine. Have and sometimes I... Uh, how did you balance yourself? Were you, did you just did you just use your right foot or your left foot, or did you use one and they get tired and use the other? I I used to do the the to 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 use only the 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 right foot. I was a tap dancer, and I think being a tap dancer got me into a mindset of being bored if I just did it one way. And there's a, a a wonderful Foley artist here. I'm sure he's retired now, Jerry Trent, who was an incredibly good dancer. I've seen his dancing in movies. And he also, I'm sure, I mean, he was a wonderful Foley artist. He did a lot of dance Foley too, but just as a Foley artist, he was really one of our best Foley artists. And he was very good with props and really good at walking footsteps. And I think the fact that we were both tap dancers informed our approach of how we did footsteps because I thought his footstep work was really excellent. And I think the fact that he'd been a tap dancer, you you use different parts of your feet to get different sounds I mean, in footsteps. When you've been a tap dancer, if, you're used to using all kinds of parts of your feet. <laughs> if you've been a tap dancer, the, that's another level for me. But... But what I mean by that is you're you you're using the outside of your foot and the heel of your foot and the inside of your foot and the ball of your feet and your toes. And I think just knowing that I was thinking about all the parts of my feet, and I know Jerry was an even better 
dancer than I was. I mean, I watched him in movies. I was a good dancer, but he was a great dancer. And um, I think all of the things that we did before we were Foley artists kind of changed the way we approached doing our work. One of these days, I'd love to do a panel of just a bunch of people who are Foley artists and what they did before they were Foley artists and how did that change the way they <laughs> approached just doing footsteps? Because I think that would be a really interesting, like, what did you do before you were a Foley artist? What did you do? I don't remember. Uh, before I was a Foley artist, I, I was a, a sound editor. And uh, and the way I th I've always thought about uh, Foley, it's uh, very from the perspective of the sound editor, the sound the monteur de son, montador de son, because uh, you have to think what uh, you have to think in Foley. What's uh, something that uh, the sound editing can never do, and and that's very important. Um, because if you think, uh, if you think as a sound editor too, you can see and feel um, what works and what uh, don't actually works for the film. I don't know how to explain it very well in English, but. Uh, it helped me a lot um, before doing Foley, working as a sector. I think uh, for me, the the Foley is, uh, is a way of uh, cutting sound from a library, but uh, performed by a human and super just customize it because uh, there's something I never like uh, when when we do the whole sound post production. It's uh, when the the sound effects editor edit uh, edits something that's very foley, like for example, sit up, uh, sit downs, say, uh, get ups, and um, some hands, some kind of even grabbing a door knob and things like that. If, if I hear it in sound effects. To me, it sounds super unreal because it sounds uh, not right for the image, and uh, and the way I work um, with Foley is always like, uh, well, I'm going to do this, 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 and this because it's very difficult or barely imp nearly impossible to a sound editor. So. That's very good when working on TV shows because, uh, as you know, in Europe, we have the habit of the sound editors not queuing uh, Foley. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. Not in not the whole Europe I've ever seen a queuing session like, uh, for example, in America. Mm. And I think uh, sometimes and uh, like like for example the footsteps like I said I think the the way the Americans do it is uh, is better because sometimes the sound editor here says well you did all the doors and the car doors but uh, I I was cutting that and I say to myself well you should have cue it and uh, with uh, with a, with a lot of stuff too, and uh, for me the the way of doing it in in America is uh, that would be a dream in here. I know it takes time, and it take it needs uh, that the sound editor is very confident and know what he can do as a sound editor and what he cannot do. And sometimes uh, they tell you, well, please uh, record, for example, lots of punches and things like that, um, that many times are covered in body falls and many things that are covered in sound effects. And they tell you, 
I'm going to do that. But if you do it, we can combine and we can see what's better and things like that. Well, that's cool if the budget is super high, but uh, it sometimes it isn't. Why do you suppose that there isn't queuing to let you know what they need? Why are they not doing that? Do they not have the time or it just isn't? I think that that takes time and uh, it's more it's more comfortable for them just to send you the the quick time image and the song a few notes saying i want this here please don't forget this uh, and at this moment the uh, this guy does that off screen but uh, since i i've worked with uh, american sound editors and for me the, always was like oh man this is very good because they even tell you in america uh, he goes from here from wood to stone and then in carpet and things like that and sometimes i had an an editor tell, telling me please do this uh, do this part of the house very creaky sounding wood and then i watched the film and and think well i can see tile I'm not going to creak uh, wood um, just because you have that that in mind. Right. And uh, it's maybe because they don't pay much attention to the to the folly queuing. I mean, it's it's very comfortable for for people here just send you the, the image. In general, I'm very proud of the Hollywood system. Um there are, I mean, I can be critic. I can find being a critical thinker. I can look for detail and things that can always be better in anything because I'm kind of someone who likes to refine and perfect. But I would have to say, I am very proud to have come up in the Hollywood system. I am very proud of my sound peeps. Um, there are things that I like about the New York sound. There are things I like about Bay Area. There are things I like about European. There, are, but. I am very proud to have come up in Hollywood. I have a long history being a Hollywood person. Um, my grandfather started out in silent films in as a um, a sound a stage manager and then as um, someone who was in construction art director, kind of a you know in the days when job descriptions were sort of loose. He was at RKO and. And my mother was an assistant choreographer. And I'm very proud to be from Hollywood. And I think our system is really well structured with some people being phenomenal. I can find things that I would refine. And there are people that I think are not following the system properly. But in general, I'm pretty darn proud of it. I know the, uh, I, I say this, uh, I tell you this uh, with knowledge because uh, I've been... I've worked on more than 330 projects so far. I'm 40 years old, but oh my uh, gosh, you're just a kid. On, on lots of films and lots of TV shows. And that's something really, really annoys me from here the not queuing system. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, what really annoys me is when you work a lot on something and you deliver lots of tracks and you try to synthesize, uh, not be super overwhelming for the sound editor. They tell you, well, you've done a lot. Um, it takes a, a lot of time for me to see what I need and what, and what I don't need. And I think to myself, oh, you've... <laughs> You should have told me what you needed, but you were so lazy that uh, you, you said, uh, just uh, give it to me, give everything to me. And then if uh, if I don't have time, I, I can complain. That's something I really like from, from the American system. I want to hear another time. We'll talk more about, maybe we can talk with your mixer. Maybe we can talk with the two of you together. I'd like to meet Diego. Yes. I hope you have a 
lovely evening because it's evening for you. It's morning for me because you are nine hours ahead. At, it's the end of January. And of course, this will be released in February, but I hope you have a lovely 2024. It's so good to see you again, Miguel. Miguel Barbosa. Thank you. Bro. And yes. um, it's good to see you and we'll talk again. Thank you. Okay. It was very good to see you too.